and you have all the different federal agencies, the Department of Defense, for example, um, the Bureau of Reclamation, for instance, people like the Department of Homeland Security, they all control their own roadways. And that's just at the federal level. Then you have the United States Department of Transportation agencies, like Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit, and the Federal Railroad Administration, just naming three of them. So the next level you go down to is the state, the Arizona Department of Transportation. They control the state highways. Counties are obviously responsible for their own county roads. Then you have cities and towns. And then finally, in this particular case, not necessarily in order of precedence, I should add, um, even though the cities and towns have probably the bulk of the work of the responsibilities, you then have Indian communities and they have their own lands and facilities. So effectively, who decides what gets done first? Who decides on the priorities? The federal government found several years ago in the mid fifties that it was appropriate in metropolitan areas and they're defined as greater than 50,000 that they, they needed to set up a metropolitan planning organization which represented all of the different agencies concerned and that agency which is the one I'm, I'm uh, honored to run um, to, to be the director for um, coordinates the transportation efforts for the whole region. Anyhow, uh, that's what YMPO does. In this particular case, we have five major items, which I'm delighted to report, and I won't go over again because they're listed on there, on the board there. You, we have five major items that we have to carry out every year. Long range plan is actually a 24 year process, or 24 year time horizon. The transportation improvement program is only five years but that's in a lot more detail. The air quality conformity analysis, you're probably aware, we're actually in non-attainment for two air quality pollutants, particulate matter of less than 10 microns, and which is a fancy way of saying big dust, not fine dust, but big dust, because there is a particulate matter of less than 2.5 microns as well. We're okay for that. But then you will, in this particular case, we're in non-attainment for that and for ozone. So any transportation plans that we come up with, we have to make sure that those plans aren't going to make air quality worse. So we have to run what's called an air quality conformity analysis on those plans prior to putting them into place. As an agency, we have to do a work program, effectively an annual budget. And then the final item is we're always audited every single year to make sure we're spending the mix primarily of federal funds. We're spending the mix appropriately. If we go back to the transportation improvement program, where does infrastructure fit here? I'm sorry. Where does that? infrastructure fit? Is there any infrastructure involved in the transportation improvement program? Um, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the uh, of the council. Um, that depends on how you define it. I'm sorry to say this, but that depends on how you define infrastructure, which appears to have changed somewhat in the past month. Um, but if I define infrastructure essentially as roads and um, transportation facilities, um, what's in the tip are any roadways which are funded with federal transportation funds. That's what has to be in the tip. And any improvement which widens a roadway and affects air quality. So if you were building a small little side street somewhere, we almost certainly wouldn't be, that wouldn't make a difference. If you're adding an additional lane to US 95, yeah, that would make a major difference. So it depends on the classification of the roadway. And um, I could get into a lot more detail on that, but it occurs to me that that's probably not appropriate. I would be very happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting if you felt uh, that would be of interest um, and, give, and go into far more detail. Anyhow, suffice to say, um, next uh, slide, please. Do I control that? Okay. Okay. As a result, we work with all of the agencies involved. They're all listed there. 
We'll start off with the Arizona Department of Transportation because they are the biggest provider of transportation in this region. As an individual agency, they are the biggest provider. The next most important one is, of course, the city of Somerton, because I know who I'm presenting to right now. Um, and then, then the other agencies, in perhaps in order of size from that point of view. Uh, most importantly, down the bottom there, we do work with Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit. We do actually pay attention to the Kichon tribe, even though they're not officially a full member of YMPO. We do work with them. We also have a small portion of our planning area is across the border in California, um, uh, in Winter Haven, for example. So as a result, we're a bi-state MPO. So obviously, as you can see, we work with ADOT. In this particular case, the ADOT State Transportation Board is the agency which oversees transportation. We do have a, a member on the Arizona State Transportation Board member. Uh, that's uh, Council Member Gary Knight from the city of Yuma. And he's currently in his third year of a six-year period, a six-year time frame. Um, the State Transportation Board has policy, powers can make policy. Primarily, though, the State Transportation Board is, a, is responsible for approving a five-year facilities construction program. It's actually transportation facilities construction program. That's the state highway program. Um, and this is basically a segue into ADOT. The ADOT program will come back a little bit later. Next one, please. In this particular case, what I'm looking at is how much does the State Transportation Board spend in Arizona? How much money does the State Transportation Board have to split up? And effectively, what they're talking about is they have eight hundred million dollars in federal funds. That's how much they got in fiscal year 2020. Okay, so eight hundred million dollars. They also collect about one point five billion, bigger pardon, one point four billion dollars. Make sure I've kept my place here. One point four billion dollars in highway user revenue funds. Those are primarily, uh, we'll come on to that in just a, a moment. The federal funds are almost completely gasoline taxes, gasoline or diesel taxes. So where do they come from? As far as the federal fund portion are concerned, they come from a federal bill. So these federal bills are approved usually every six years, and then every single year, they uh, make amendments to how much money is available through the annual budget process. In this case, again, I'm going to throw a bunch of numbers at you, but $80 million goes directly to the big two metropolitan areas. That's the Maricopa Association of Governments, which is where I worked for about 12 years, but that's okay. I don't work there anymore, so I still know them as the, uh, the great state of Maricopa. And the Pima Association of Governments down in Tucson. Between them, they get the 80 million plus they get half of the remaining federal funds, which is a pretty big chunk. Having said that, since population-wise, they have about 75% of the population of the state of Arizona, that's probably not unfair. But regardless of that, they then also, at that particular point, the State Transportation Board has $280 million, about 280 to divide up between the rest of the, uh, the state. Now, ADOT only allocates, when I say allocates, they give the spending authority about 10 million bucks down to the rural MPOs. And there are eight MPOs in the state, six of them are rural MPOs. YMPO is the largest of the rural MPOs. However, we only receive $1 million, about just over a million dollars every year. And that's in surface transportation block grant money. And we use that primarily for all of our member agencies for construction, for constructing projects. And as you're aware, knowing your own um, capital improvements program, that doesn't go that far. 
So the next uh, slide, please. Now this one, got it here. Thank you. This one, I've actually provided a bigger uh, sheet on, and if you'd like to take a look at this later, it is kind of interesting because this is where the money comes from. The vast majority of the money comes from gasoline taxes and diesel taxes, plus your vehicle license tax. So that's when the vast majority of the money comes from. Effectively, where does it go, though? That's the important part. This totals about $1.5 billion a year. Highway user revenue funds. This is state gasoline taxes, effectively. But of the 1.5 billion, about 40 million just goes off the top to various programs. That would be nice to be able to say that, wouldn't it? Now, the counties get about 273 million. All the cities and towns between them, they get almost 400 million, 396. But for example, the city of Summerton last year received just under 1.4 million of that 396 in highway user revenue funds. That's, that's how much the city of uh, Somerton got. Then there are various other portions of money which go to different locations. Um, ADOT operations take almost $400 million, 386. That's just to run ADOT, to pay the salaries for ADOT for them to operate the state highway system. When it boils down to it, there's less than $200 million available for statewide construction projects. I have a question. <clears throat> Please. Um, how can we increase the YMPO allocation from one million? Could I please come on to that in a short while, uh, Mr. Weissman? Um, I, because I, I will cover that in, in a very short while. Okay. Um, okay. This is the program. And again, this is available for, to you electronically. There are 10 pages. The current program that ADOT has provided, and next page, please. Um, and again, I trust me, there won't be a test on this. What I've done is I've taken, this is like over 200 pages. I have taken a snapshot of 10 pages, which detail all of the projects that are being done in the Yuma metropolitan area, primarily on I-8, US-95, and those sorts of projects. From that point of view, if, uh, with your blessing, uh, Mr. Weissmeyer, I, I won't go into that. Okay, um, okay next uh, page, please. What an amazing table. This is the summary table, which says how much money ADOT is spending. And again, I know the important parts here. Effectively, ADOT's programming about $1.4 billion that's actually the, uh, the top, bigger part in the bottom arrow that's on there. What they're spending in the Yuma region is 63 million. Sorry, 63 million. 63 million. This, this particular table's in here, it's a summary table. Um, now, from that point of view, that isn't anywhere close to what it should be. And this comes on to your point, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Next page, please. Okay, as far as transportation funding for Arizona is concerned, how does ADOT allocate their funds? ADOT allocates their funds based on need. And this is basically, even though ADOT doesn't give us a fair share, and we'll come on to that in just a moment, they do it reasonably logically. And they base the need on how many miles of state highways, how many lane miles of state highways do you have in your county? Because it's ADOT's job to maintain those state miles. And that's where they spend the vast majority of their money. Yuma County has a relatively low number of miles for the population that we have. 
How that happened, uh, with all due respect, I won't go into right now because that's kind of partial uh, history. But from that point of view, the problem is, is that we pay a lot of money into the system, primarily by doing gasoline taxes, um, the vehicle license tax, um, diesel taxes, and we don't get our fair share back. Primarily because that fair share goes to two or three or four other states that get a disproportionately large share because they have more miles, lane miles of state highways. If I was the director of ADOT, I would probably do the same thing in their defense. Unfortunately, what that results in, is that results in us subsidizing other counties roadway systems. Next page, please. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on this one. Effectively, what it shows is it shows that we get $63 million. The two counties that are the closest to us in population and in the amount of money put into the system are Yavapai County, and they currently, within the current five-year program, they get substantially more than us, um, at least uh, 50% more than us, and Mojave County is getting an incredible amount of money this particular five-year pro process, primarily because they have a, a kind of odd interstate that goes right across the corner of Mojave County. It's called I-15. It has lots of bridges in which are very expensive and they're in very bad condition. So ADOT doesn't have the discretion to say, yeah, we're not going to build those bridges. We're not going to repair them. They have to repair them. They're interstate bridges. So ADOT has to spend a lot of their federal funds. That's a little bit unfair in this particular case. <clears throat> but I went back 30 years. And this isn't just the last five years. I've analyzed the programs for the past five years, and we do not get our fair share. So from that point of view, we're kind of losing out a little bit. The next page, please. Okay, funding levels, past and present. Um, this essentially, I've pretty much already covered this. This is where um, I'm t telling you um, Mojave County and Yavapai County gets too much. So next white page, please. I'm trying to cut this a little bit shorter. Okay. The major problem we've got is lack of funding. And the major problem with lack of funding is in this case, that's almost completely up to you, Mr. Vice Mayor. All of the members of the council here, you don't pay enough gasoline taxes. None of you. And neither do I, by the way. Primarily because gas taxes haven't increased in 30 years. What that means, and next page, please. A gallon of gas a gallon of gas 30 years ago, which used to be a dollar 15, had about 38 cents of that dollar 15 was gas taxes. And now the price of a gallon of gas is three bucks. Guess what the gas taxes are? 38 cents still. So even though the price has increased nearly three times, we still only get the same amount of uh, uh, cash per gallon because it's done per gallon. It's not done on the price of a gallon of gas, pretty much like every single other tax out there. The other problem is that the same car, the equivalent car 30 years ago, compared with the equivalent car today, the car today will drive over one and a half times the number of miles for the same gallon of gas, and therefore for the same 37 cents that they're paying. As a result, it's about four to five times, one quarter to one fifth of the amount of money we get back to give to your public works director to maintain your roadways compared with what we were getting 30 years ago. 
based on every single mile traveled. So from that point of view, what do we do? The answer is, is the, the federal government hasn't raised the gasoline tax. Neither has the state government, as it turns out. If they haven't done it in 30 years, I'm thinking they're probably not going to do it. So what has the rest of the state done? And the rest of the state, 80%, actually 85% of the rest of the state, has implemented a half-cent sales tax. That half-cent sales tax essentially is for transportation purposes only and goes in this primarily to back to the areas in which those funds were raised. So that may be a, a solution. It's been a solution in 85% of the rest of the state that may be a solution that we can try to adopt here. The only agency within our region is the city of Yuma. The city of Yuma has actually implemented a sales tax. They did that about 12, 15 years ago, maybe. Anyhow, from that point of view, next page, please. This is the last page, Mr. Chairman. Um, in this case, YMPO is going through our long range transportation plan. We're doing our best in this case we're hoping in this case, we're anticipating if we become within the most recent census, if we, depending on the population count we have, we may be classified as a transportation management area. If that's the case, we're going to take an increase from that $1 million that I mentioned. Automatically, we'll take an increase up to $4 million. We're also lobbying with the state agency to recognize us as a transportation planning agency and to allocate the funds to our region and allow our member agencies to select more of the projects that make sense to us and not just to plug pretty much all the money onto state highways. We do have the responsibility for taking care of those state highways still, or we would have if they were given back to us, so to speak. But in this case, that's where we have the opportunity for gaining more money and more flexibility over programming those funds. So that's likely to happen over the next uh, six months. We're going to finish off our long range transportation plan. And we have a, a variety of different uh, studies which we're going through at the moment. Uh, we'll finish off the long range transportation plan within the next three months. And that is probably going to recognize a possible half cent sales tax and what we can do with those funds if it gets approved by the population. And obviously, it would have to go for a vote of the people. Okay, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the, of the council, thank you very much. And uh, I hope I haven't taken over too much more time. Um, and that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions or I'm happy to give you my contact details and you're very welcome to call me offline at some point in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to a 6.2, presentation by Enterprise Fleet Management regarding possible fleet leave option to replace city vehicles. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Members, Serena Gallegos. I have uh, Travis Manning um, from Enterprise here to present to you a possible option for leasing for the city of uh, Summerton. Um, I'll, I'll let him start up. Uh, can you unmute him? Thank you. Hi, Travis. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, well good evening, members of council and uh, vice mayor. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start and share my screen with you so I can present the fleet synopsis that we've created. Just let me know here if everyone can see what I'm displaying. All right, can everyone see the uh, fleet synopsis city of Somerton here? On the shared 
Oh. I think we're doing right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you sure? Um, yes, I'm sure you did. I heard on my screen, but. Is it presenting? Yes, but I believe you're on a time delay and we have the presentation here. So okay. rather than sharing your screen, we'll go ahead and move forward on those slides. That's perfect. If that works better, absolutely. We can definitely do that way. Thank you. All righty. So yeah, we'll just start here at the, the first slide again. Um, with the help of Serena, with the help of Griselda, with the help of Sam, we were able to create a detailed fleet analysis and a replacement cycle for the city of Summerton just to combat with the, the older age fleet. Um, so we could just hop right into the next slide. The title should be Current Government Partners. All right, and on this slide here, this is just a high level view of some of our government partners. We partnered with about 298 different companies, government, municipalities here in the state of Arizona. Um, I, I would like to highlight the city of Douglas. They're not too far from Summerton, Cottonwood, Sourwita. We've created some really great relationships with those cities. Um, so at the end of this presentation, if there is an opportunity to continue the conversation, we'd love to put you folks in contact with some of those current partners so they can give you a better idea of how we've helped them manage their fleet today. All right, I'm gonna go right into the next slide. Um, the title should be Fleet Synopsis, City of Summerton, and at the top in black, it should say Impact of the Partnership. Perfect. So this is just a synopsis of kind of what's going on with your current fleet. Um, just high level, about 90% of your fleet is over 10 years or older. Um, typically what we see in the government space is older vehicles typically have higher maintenance costs, higher fuel costs because they're just not getting the same miles per gallon as a, as a younger fleet. And um, some safety features that aren't always the best. And um, also they're just unreliable. So you see a lot of soft costs just due to downtime. So our objective for the city of Somerton is to leverage our open-ended lease just to maximize on your equity um, and also your uh, amazing purchase power on the front end. So with our lease structure, taking care of your immediate needs in year one, which is about 16 vehicles, um, as discussed through Sam and Serena, your cash outlay will be about $94,000 to replace exactly what you need done in year number one um, versus the $409,000 cash outlay if you were to purchase all those vehicles outright. Some other items that come with that is, um, again, we're, we not only lease vehicles to our current clients, but we're a fleet management company. So we'll also help you with the resale process. We structure all of our leases to make sure you're receiving the lowest total cost of ownership. And at the end of that lease cycle, we'll actually sell that vehicle for you to maximize on that equity and then put that money back into your fleet budget. A lot of our current government partners um, pride on themselves in our relationship due to that. Um, at the age that we're typically recycling those vehicles, um, they have a decent amount of equity in them, especially considering the great purchase price you get on the front end. And we're really able to maximize that. We've got over 800 sales individuals that are gonna sell that vehicle as soon and as fast as possible. It's just to really, again, take care of that equity on the back end. Um, by replacing those vehicles, we're also gonna drive down your maintenance costs. Right now, you're about $130 a vehicle on average, and we're going to bring that down to about $28 a vehicle. So you'll see some, some significant cost savings there on the maintenance spectrum as well. Um, and obviously, again, newer vehicles are just more fuel efficient, right? Like the future um, is electric here coming shortly and, and the hybrids and everything else. But more immediately, you'll you'll see an average MPG of about 10 to 12 miles per gallon to around you know, 28 to 30. So there's a decent amount of cost savings there. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and get into the next slide here. So we were also able to create a, a fleet safety analysis for you. So out of the um, out of your fleet, you got over a hundred, but we limited just to your light duty. And we also took out all of your emergency response vehicles. So the 51 here is just light duty, no emergency response. And, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me there. And out of the 51 vehicles, um, 46, so about 90% of your fleet, uh, we would deem in our red area as far as your safety. Um, two big triggers that will put you in that category is your electronic stability control. Um, that's deemed to be the most significant invention since the seatbelt. 
And uh, another major item there is also just your tire, tire pressure management system. Um, this is just alerting your driver if there is a low, uh, low air in your tire or, or your tire is deflated. So um, without having those two items there, that would deem you in our red category. Uh, we got three in the yellow and two in the green, but uh, just big picture. I mean, we've, we've got a good idea that the fleet is just a little bit older and about 90% of the vehicles in your fleet we would deem um, in, our, in our red category as far as your safety. All right, and do we have any questions? Um, before I continue, I just wanted to make sure I, I, I got some questions answered before continuing to the, uh, the fleet profile. Vice Mayor, I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, this this cost savings that you're that you're talking about is directly related to old vehicles compared to new vehicles. But I mean, as we all know, when you buy a vehicle, the first few years there's hardly any maintenance to it because simply all you're doing is oil changes and probably tire rotations. Exactly. So there's really no comparison. I think for me. I would want to know the cost savings as far as purchasing it versus leasing it. Leasing it to me is just as simply renting a, a, a vehicle. Absolutely. Uh, for me, uh, vice mayor, council members, if we're going to purchase a, a new fleet, I suggest that we flat out purchase it versus, versus leasing vehicles. I mean, I lease them for four years at the end of the fourth year. Yes, I have an option to buy but now I have to provide funding to, to buy them. You know, yeah. or I, don't, I just turn them in and I walk away from them. But the, these vehicles, they, they last a long time nowadays. Example, mine is a 2006 Chevy Silverado. I probably put like 2,000 out of my own pocket and I still have it to the day. And it's 224,000 miles in and I can still drive all, all the way to Phoenix, San Diego on it because it's pretty reliable. Absolutely. And a, and a big difference from our lease to your typical lease, um, I think the lease that you're mentioning is a closed ended lease. And, and what that means for us is at the end of your lease cycle, yeah, you turn that vehicle in, you wipe your hands with it and you're and it's over um, with the lease structure that we provide to our government clients. And what we want to bring to you is what we call an open ended lease. So at the end of that open ended lease, we write it down to a residual. So a dollar amount. So, for example, um, you know, it's a fifteen thousand dollar car. At the end of your four years, you owe five thousand dollars on that car, and our sale price for that car might be around ten thousand dollars. So that additional equity that I was mentioning would then go back into your fleet budget. And what really benefits our government clients is your buying power. We've got some scenarios where we've got cities or counties that are purchasing trucks in year one, maybe for twenty eight thousand um, dollars, with with their uh, with their government contract buy and that MSRP on that same truck might be right around thirty seven to thirty eight thousand dollars. And if they were to sell that vehicle in year one or two um, with the equity gain, they would actually make money on that vehicle. So maybe a thousand or two thousand dollar credit back to their fleet budget with them spending twenty eight thousand dollars on that truck and us selling it in two years for thirty thousand um, dollars. So that's the lease structure that we're bringing to the city. So you kind of got a win win. You're paying low monthly maintenance costs for the for the extension of your lease term. And then at the end of that lease term with that state contract buy, in some scenarios you're actually making money. And in other scenarios, it's a, it's, a, it's a low cost just overall because again, of that great buy you're getting on the front end and our ability to resell that vehicle for you on the back end. So I would still have to refinance uh, the $10,000 that in your scenario, I would still have to refinance the $10,000. $10, so again, you know, why lease it versus me just flat out buying it and taking care of uh, taking care of the payments once and for all. And quite honestly, I mean, to bring in a whole fleet all at once, it might be doable for a lease, but eventually I would have to refinance those ten ten thousand dollars one way or the other. Per when, yeah, when you say refinance those vehicles, what what do you mean by that? I'm sorry, I'm I'm not sure. Well, we wouldn't have to finance it because obviously I might not have $10,000 per vehicle to buy them outright. Because at the end of the lease, you're still going to char charge me a, a lump sum in or if I want the vehicle. Yeah, so again, at 
with our lease structure, you own all rights to that vehicle. Our, we're, we're basically allowing you a line of credit through enterprise. Um, and again, with your buying power of your vehicles, the way that we write these vehicles down, you will not owe enterprise any money on any of your lease terms unless something um, extremely unique happens, I guess I should say. So for example, again, um, I guess it, it probably makes the most sense just to go to slide number, not the city of Somerton fleet replacement analysis, but the top will be equity lease menu pricing. And I think this will best describe our uh, our leasing structure. Are you able to see that? Perfect. So for example, uh, a full size sedan, the Malibu there, the 2022 at the top. Again, this is the immediate needs that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, this is just an example to give you an idea of the lease structure. It's a 48 month term. Um, your government fleet cost on this is $19,695. Your monthly lease payment is $360. Again, we're going to provide you with our full maintenance to cover everything from an oil change to a full engine replacement at $27 a month for the term. And your reduced book value, so again, at the end of your term, um, you're going to owe $5,593 on that vehicle. We're estimating to sell that vehicle right now for $12,600. Um, these estimates are extremely conservative. Coming into this agreement, we want to make sure that we're not overpromising anything. So your estimated equity on that vehicle is around $7,000. Um, so again, that gives you an idea of what that lease structure will look like and what kind of equity you could expect on some of your returns. Um, I mean, as you can see, the, the, the 1500 the work truck, you're around $9,364 worth of equity in that. But again, you're still maximizing on all the equity at the end of the lease. We're just selling that vehicle for you. So there's, you wouldn't be refinancing or, or anything like that. And all of these vehicles, you guys are putting your money down. <clears throat> Does that answer some of the questions about the lease? You know what? I, I have a question. Just want to wanna make sure that I'm understanding correctly. So looking at, 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 at that top one, that, the quantity, so it'll cost us a total of uh, the government fleet. It's nineteen thousand six hundred ninety-five dollars. We break exactly. that down. It's going to be sixty dollars a month. We got that full maintenance. It gets to, it, the reduced book value is five thousand five ninety-three. The estimate resale is twelve thousand six hundred. So that means we made seven thousand in equity. If we were to let's say move in this direction, when we add the numbers, it's going to end up costing us about thirteen thousand for those four years. I'm sorry, can you say that again? It's going to cost you what for the four years? Okay, so so for example, <clears throat> when, when you're talking about the estimated equity, it's $7,007. So the government cost is $19,695. I'm assuming that's the total of the 48-month term, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay, so now we I can get that estimated equity and I subtract it by that $19,695, that's going to give me a ballpark figure of around $13,000, right? Exactly. Is that how much it's going to cost us for that vehicle for those four years? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to do it would just take the 360 times 48, right? Because that's the term, and that'll let you know exactly what your cash outlay would be to have that vehicle across that amount of time. you wouldn't have a vehicle if you if they sold it for you yeah so what that is yeah so when we would sell that vehicle for you that that equity would then again put back into your fleet budget which you could then apply to your upcoming lease and then the net monthly payment equity here that shows you what your upcoming payments will look like once you get on that cycle so you will be going from 360 a month down to 213 so as this program continues you'll have lower monthly payments by using that equity gain or rollover from your your previous lease but um I'm sorry. You would gain equity and you would never be a true owner of a, of a vehicle because I would have to jump into another lease agreement and after that one's over, another one and so forth versus if I buy a car and finance it for 
six years, I'm done paying it. Guess what? I own it. Yeah, and, and honestly, so with our leasing structure, if you wanted to purchase those vehicles outright, we can we could depreciate that vehicle however you see fit. So if you wanted just to pay cash for those vehicles, <clears throat> we still get your government contract to buy. You could pay cash for those vehicles. The reason why we're developing this depreciation and that lease structure is so we could take advantage of those immediate needs that you guys actually have, right? Again, 90% of the current fleet is over 10 years or older, right? A lot of those vehicles just aren't deemed safe to drive. So in order to replace what needs to be replaced, we create a creative lease structure that allows you to really capitalize on your state contract buys, get out of them before you pay an excess amount in maintenance and fuel, and then capitalize on the equity at the end of the term. And we'll do all that for you, right? We deliver your vehicle turnkey ready to go. We pick the vehicle up when it needs to be sold. So you're low, so you're receiving the lowest total cost of ownership per vehicle. Um, again, we work with multiple cities, multiple governments, and this worked out great for them because it's really driving down their maintenance expense and also their fuel costs. And it almost becomes a cost neutral or a cost savings to get out of it at that optimal time. So you're not paying all that extra in maintenance and fuel on the back end of the life of that vehicle. There, there's a question here, uh, Councilman uh, Gonzalez. Yeah, I kind of agree with uh, Councilman Villapando. And I, I, I truly believe on this just for probably a year or two. But if you're going to go up to four years, again, the loan, in, in the long run, might as well buy the vehicle because uh, you, you ended up paying less interest, less, et cetera. But again, you know, it's, it all depends on uh, what we're going to do as a council. But I do kind of agree with the with the councilman via bond, you know, it's, it's pretty much playing with numbers, but at the end of the day, I might as well buy it instead of leasing it. Like I say, if it's going to be like the one year lease, it's fine. But if you've got to go to four, five, six, six years, at the end of the day, you're going to probably end up paying more than if you were to buy the vehicle. And that's my own perception. So. And you know what, I'm, uh, I, I think looking at this, um, I, you know, I think with what's being presented to us, you know, I, I think it gives us that opportunity to have our vehicles, our city vehicles, uh, up to date at all times. You know, uh, and you know, and, and to me, I'm just 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 looking at just looking at that first example. You know, it's going to cost us a total of nineteen thousand six hundred ninety-five dollars. You know, for four years. Uh, but now, you know, with with the equity, the estimated equity. I mean, being that it's open-ended, we have it gives us that flexibility to let's say upgrade or decide to buy or, you know, um, but at the same time, I think it gives us that peace of mind and, and I think it provides us that stability when it comes to the budgeting where, okay, we, I mean, we're not paying for unexpected expenses that would come up for our vehicles. Um, so when I, I mean, when I look at this graph right here, if I'm going to give, you be getting approximately $7,000 in equity, you know, at, at the end of the lease, you know, you know, I'm looking at, it's only going to cost us thirteen thousand dollars to have a, a a reliable vehicle for you know use it for four years and then afterwards we have that option to to either you know upgrade for the newer model or or then decide what's more convenient uh, uh for us depending on where we're at um that's how i'm kind of seeing it um you know um I, you know i i you know, uh, that, that's just my opinion on it. I mean, I understand the, the leasing versus buying, um, but if I can get a vehicle, up-to-date vehicle, and I'm looking at a, what, at a 2022, you know, for using it for like $13,000 at the end of the day for those four years, you know, even if we buy it outright, when you sub, when, when you add it up, I mean, it's just 13,000, I mean, you, you double that, that's probably what you're gonna end up paying but at the end of the year, when it's yours, you're looking at maybe using it for like eight years, but it's already, you know, the wear and tear. Um, I like the idea of this, that it, it, it really provides us that stability and, and, and um, we're able to kind of control, um, you know, the maintenance of it. it. Again, which might be very limited because the vehicle is, you know, uh, that's just my take on that. Um, you can pretty much do the same thing. With with a, with a purchased vehicle, you could hold on to it for the six years, turn around and sell it, and you're still going to get a, on a truck easily 
eight, nine, ten thousand dollars, if not, if not a lot more. I mean, I my again, my truck is a two thousand six, and I could easily get six grand for it. Absolutely. And if I could just interject, if I, I just want to high level review the city of Summerton fleet replacement analysis, I think if we review this analysis, it'll kind of paint the picture for what we have prepared for you today. I think that will answer a lot of questions and kind of really show an offer and show you what our value proposition really would be to the city of Summerton. So again, it's titled city of Summerton fleet replacement analysis at the top. All right, so um, I just want to review this. There's a lot of numbers on this page. This is really what I wanted to get to. I'm sorry that we kind of got off there. I apologize about that. But I'm going to go line for line. I'm going to start in the left corner. Right there it says current fleet. So again, your current fleet of light duty vehicles is 51. Um, you currently don't have a cycle point. So the algorithm showed it at 51 years as your cycle point just because how old the fleet is. Um, your current maintenance spend on average per vehicle right now, this is coming from a third party case study with a fleet similar to your size from a different government entity and our internal data with our 2 million vehicles plus, you're spending about $130 a month per vehicle in maintenance. Your maintenance cost on a cent per mile is about 21 cents a mile. Um, your annual mileage for the city based upon the data presented to us with your odometer readings is at 7,500 miles. Your current miles per gallon based upon the age of your fleet and your vehicle makeup is right around 12 miles per gallon based upon our data. Um, so this is what we're proposing for the city of Summerton. We're going to keep your fleet size right where it's at, right at the 51. Um, we're going to propose a cycle point from not having a cycle point and it being plus, you know, 20 years to a four-year cycle point. That was that lease structure that we designed. And again, that's extremely flexible. So if we want to hold it for six, we want to hold it for two, we could get granular before the case of this analysis. We set it at four so you can have an idea of where we're going with everything. What's really nice about dropping that cycle point is it really drives down your maintenance expense. You go from spending $130 per vehicle to $28.22, that's a locked-in budgeted price with Enterprise. That is concrete. So moving forward, you know exactly what you're spending in maintenance and we're driving down that cost. We're proposing for this analysis for your fuel cost that the price of gas is right at $2.50 a gallon. Um, so in year one, you'll see fiscal year, you'll see 21. Again, your fleet size is 51. We're taking care of those immediate needs in year one that we discussed with Sam and Serena. So that's right at 16. You're still going to own 35 vehicles outright through the city. But again, we're getting rid of your oldest. Uh, again, your immediate needs, the vehicles that we got to get out of, right? So you're not purchasing anything outright. So we're at zero there. So your annual lease payments with Enterprise for that first year is $89,000. Um, out of those 16 vehicles that we're selling for you, we're going to get rid of the get rid of those 16 and put $9,000 worth of equity back into your budget. Um, your maintenance expense in year one is going to be sixty thousand. Your fuel is going to be seventy three, and your total fleet budget is right at two thirteen seventy forty four. In twenty twenty two, we're going to still keep you at the fifty one fleet size again. We're going to replace twelve more vehicles. Now you're only going to own out twenty three. Now you're going to have twenty eight on lease with us. That's your lease payments there, the one sixty nine two eighty four. And then again, we're getting rid of those vehicles, so we're taking out the. Um, the 12 oldest vehicles from there. So now you got $15,000 of equity rolling back into your budget. Again, we're driving down your maintenance costs. We're driving down your fuel costs. Your total fleet budget is 267. So we continue to do that until year number one, two. Year number five, you'll be fully vested with enterprise. So now you get to be able to capitalize on that equity from those lease gains. So, you're, so you'll be totally vested with enterprise. Your entire fleet will be on lease. You'll have equity owned coming in. You'll also have equity leased because, again, this is when that lease cycle comes up. So you'll get the equity from those vehicles. That's when your maintenance cost really drives down from that $60,000 down to seventeen. dollars Your fuel drives down and your fleet budget drives down. You'll have an average annual budget right around two thirty-six, dollars And moving forward, all your vehicles will be more reliable. They'll be new. Your folks will be in safe vehicles. And you'll know exactly what you're going to be spending every month in maintenance and fuel. Um, but yeah, those are the numbers that kind of support, you know, where we want to take the city and where we want to put the city in. I'm sure you probably got some questions because there was a lot out there. So I'll open the floor for any questions. 
Any questions? Comments? I'd just like to um, kind of reiterate, this is one of the various options that we have. And obviously we would, in my, in my opinion, we would have to combine the lease with maybe a couple of purchases, depending on the types of vehicles and the, and their best use. This is, this is if we were to go in and completely replace our fleet through enterprise. Is that necessarily what we want to do or the best option for us? Well, maybe we can take a look at that, you know, per department and identify, okay, which which vehicles make more sense to lease and which vehicles make more sense to buy. But we wanted to present this to you as a holistic so that you'd have an idea if we were to go out and replace our fleet through a lease, this is what it may look like. Salina, is, uh, is this the same organization, uh, Enterprise, that uh, Sida I believe Getting so. The one that you just did, right? Yes. yes. And, and Mayor Council, one, one of the questions, uh, or one of the things that we're bound by legally is uh, we can't just get rid of our vehicles at the end of five, six, ten years and expect to receive fair market value. We can't just sell it and put it for sale side. Remember, we have to auction our vehicles out. So don't go in there thinking that at the end of 10 years, I got a, I got, I made so many payments and I'm, I can get so much off of this car. We, we have to sell it for the highest bidder, which could be a dollar at that, that point. Depending on, uh, on where we wanted to take our fleet program. So if we wanted to continuously update our vehicles and not focus as much on repairs and maintenance, and focus more on operations, that this is the direction that we would head. But again, it's all about what's best for us and how we can structure our fleet program to best fit our needs, uh, both financially and operationally. Currently, what we're looking at is lease and currently, if I'm wrong, 27 vehicles that we have to get rid of? 40. 40. That obviously, are how many are not actually working and we still have? Well, those 40, about 14. 14. We're paying insurance on them? Sure. Yes. On those 14, no, but the other one, yes. So it just, like I said, it's about how we want to um, structure our fleet program going forward. If it makes more sense for us to do a couple of purchases with, uh, a couple of leases, then that may be the uh, direction that we go in, whatever makes better financial and operational sense to us. So, you know, I think that for the future, mm -hmm. we have to have some kind of something in place, concrete that says, you know, in 10 years or 15 years, there's so many vehicles are going to be gone. And so we're going to have to kind of have like a plan, like from the years and these years, we have a lot of options right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one of them, this presentation. Right. But I, I maybe I'm not going to be here anymore, but whoever comes and see and, and other comes members, you know, kind of like have an idea where we're at. Because I know, and I have said it, and I've read it out a long time ago, when Ian was around, and said, you know, why don't we still write it? You know, why, why don't we have employees using these vehicles that are about 20 years old, you know? I mean, as a city, you know, we, we need to kind of like move on, you know, move on, just like we're doing with the projects, same thing with transportation, you know, and, and we're getting behind all these little things that, so we need to have some kind of a, create something that stays, you know, within 15, 20 years at this part of the, just like the general plan, but in a different scenario. And if we were to want to say, okay, after every four years, rather than having a vehicle that's going to age and having to go back or maybe we determine, okay, we shouldn't have any vehicles that are over five years old within our fleet. Once it gets to that magic number, we need to, uh, we need to upgrade it. We need to sell it. We need to move forward so that we're not focusing so much on, on the repairs and maintenance and staff having to, you know, have it towed or, you know, take it to the shop, this and that, so we can focus on the operations that. Since I've been what I've seen, kind of like 
they're just getting vehicles, mm-hmm. not so much, and, you know, employees, employees other stuff. And was, now I'm not saying that it's bad, but you know, like Judge Figueroa, like every two or three years, it's just his vehicle. And he passes it on to somebody else, mm-hmm. which is fine. But again, it can't be done on all the time, you know, because you only benefit is one particular area you know, or person. We can't, compare, we can't compare the court. He has his own, he gets it through a grant and he finds his own money for that. But yeah, I think that's an example. Yeah, um, passing them on or. Vice Mayor, Council Member Gonzalez. Back in October, um, Luis Galindo, Council Member Luis Galindo had mentioned uh, regarding the vehicle, vehicle fleet. So this is the process in terms of getting into a point that. Um, we will have a 5, 10, 15 year plan. But this is just the, the starting process we can get to that point. It, it is difficult getting into some sort of plan when we never had a plan. The oldest vehicle is a 1986 vehicle. Um, so it, it's really difficult to, to get to something that we're gonna be end, end up using overall um, with that magic number. Uh, Ms. Gallegos has mentioned. So it's getting to that point. We need to do it essentially now, as many of the vehicles are, 40 vehicles need to get replaced. And it is going to cost us. And, and um, Council Member Villarpando also has a great point. It is more feasible to, to purchase them outright. And if for certain vehicles, it might be just the lease, but it might be even on purchasing. And so we just need to get to that point, and this is kind of the beginning of it. This is just a presentation. We'll bring more information to you as we get closer to our budget here in June. Yes. And, and I do want to, you know, um, commend staff for looking into this. I, I think this provides flexibility, and it, it is that starting point of, you know, what's it going to look like five years, ten years uh, for us, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I think sometimes with those 40 vehicles that are, you know, uh, not in service, I think we sometimes end up paying more in, in staff's time, you know, uh, that, 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 that ends up costing cost more if we really put a, a value to that. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd say I'm, I'm interested to see what the departments come up with, you know, uh, whether, you know, this as an option or, or purchasing to see what, what makes more sense. You know, um, and, you know and, and, and going from there. So you will also have a 1998-96 and or 2002 vehicle that we might not want to sell because that's the one that ends up using for public works to put asphalt, gravel, and so forth. So you don't want a brand new vehicle to put in there. Right? Because we're, we're not a, a primary organization to do that. So thank you for your comments, and 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 we can, like I said, come back to you with. Um, with what we believe the best plan for the city will be, um, hopefully in a couple short weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our old business discussion and possible action to approve the second reading by Title A of Ordinance Number 2021-002, an ordinance of the Mayor and Council of the City of Summerton, Arizona, amending the city code in regards to composition of the Parks and Recreation Commission, repealing any conflicting provisions and providing for severability. Good evening, Vice Mayor, Council Members, this is Mesa Parks and Recreation Director. I'm here before you to review the, the second reading of the amendment to city ordinance number 2017-002 under section 16 Last two, last two, in relation to a change of composition for the Summerton Parks and Creation Commission to revise the composition from nine to seven members. Um, just want to mention that during tomorrow's uh, Parks and Creation regular meeting, I am scheduling uh, this topic to revise the request from, from the city council to um, revise uh, Section 2.9 of the Summerton Parks and Recreation Regulations under the ordinance number 291, Article 13, Slash 2, which um, illustrates um, allowing two members, two non residents, to the, the commission. And we would restrict um, appointment of any new 
uh, non-resident membership. That was a, a request from city council that um, our plan is to review it first with the, the, the commission tomorrow's meeting, and then bring it forward to council and um, in May. Mr. President, that, that, that is a different uh, ordinance of the brought back regarding the yes. At this point, it is just ordinance number 2021 Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Questions, comments? A motion to approve ordinance 2021 Motion. Motion was made by uh, Councilman Okay, First, we need a, a motion to approve the second reading by title only, and then we can move to a final approval of the. Motion to approve. Motion was made by Councilman Rodan. Second by Councilwoman Garcia. Those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Vice Mayor, would you like to read or would you like someone from staff to read it? <laughs> Mr. Lozano, Mr. Lozano, you can read it. All right. So, <laughs> it's an ordinance of the mayor and council of the city of Summerton, Arizona, amending the city code in regards to composition of the Parks and Recreation Commission, repealing any conflicting provisions, and providing for severability. And uh, a motion to uh, a motion uh, to approve ordinance 2021. That's Motion was made by Council Member Rodan. Second by Councilwoman Garcia. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to uh, 7.2 Discussion and possible action to approve proposal for stage, sound, and lighting for 4th of July event 2021. Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council. On March, um, Rita Garcia Special Event Cornelius. On March 17th, with your approval, the RSP for stage sound and lighting services for 4th for of July was posted um, for a month on the city website. Staff personally notified the companies who usually put in a bid for our city event. Machala Productions was the only proposal uh, received. Machala Productions gave us the same price as the last public event in the, that the city had, which was summer to greater days in 2019. Staff recommends motion to approve Machala Productions for stage sound and lighting services for this year's 4th of July event 2021. Questions, Carl? Only one, huh? <laughs> what, one of them actually um, thought it was the following Friday and others had a lot of stuff going on. Tough year. Make a motion to approve item 7.2 as stated. Motion was made by uh, Councilmember Gonzalez. I have a quick question before the motion, Mayor. I mean, Vice Mayor. Right. Yes, but is there any um, is there any penalties for for this RFP if the uh, the the Machado in this in this case? doesn't deliver as expected? Yes, sir. And I wanted to apologize to council because I submitted the wrong RFP. Um, the correct one is the one that was post, that was given previous um, on the March 16th. I actually have the, um, that part and I am um, ready to read that, council member Villalpando. Um, Mr. Lozano was able to help me and in the RSP, we did put, put that a successful bidder shall complete the stage and set up by Saturday, July 3rd, 2021 at 6 p.m. prior to the event so local bands can do sound and check. There is a $200 fee, $250 fee late charge for every hour missed on south sound check deadline with a maximum of a $1,000 late charge. So this, this going forward will be on all the RFPs. So if my stage and sound is not up to date, I mean, or up to the time that I'm, I'm asking, they will have a, a late fee. 
Well, what about equipment? You know, in case at the last minute he decides to use maybe a lesser quality equipment, was that addressed? So on the on the RFP, I legitimately put what I'm asking, um, and if for some reason um, they want to recommend something else, they can. Um, it is on the on the on the RFP, but I do have specifics of, of what I'm needing. Um, in the RFP, it says bidders are encouraged to recommend a stage setup in which they feel would be the best fit for the city's Fourth of July event 2021 event. If any changes are proposed to the setup, please explain in your proposal why you feel um, the change would benefit the city. So in the RFP, I specifically have um, what I need on this specific one. I, my main event, my main um, group is a, a group of 14 people. So I did specify for extra equipment. Okay, but... I understand that. Uh, but directly to, to that equipment, I know there's for the state setup, there is a penalty, but for the equipment, did, do you guys do you guys have language in there specific that there may there be? Is, there is language where um, Mr. Lozano and, and I worked and um, for example, they require to have a security um, because to make sure that they that they have everything and no one steals anything overnight um and whatnot if for something something like that were to happen then you know they would have to pay us back but there is a specific um part in the contract where if they don't need our needs we would still put a penalty where okay. exactly in the contract i'm not sure okay just just as long as uh that that was addressed that uh, that's good enough for me thank you thank you the question i have a certificate certificate of liability that you know that needs to remain us to the city make sure that we get that a certificate uh, and also uh something that i would like to see personally is you already mentioned that you know everything has to be set up a certain time and date Somebody's gonna have to oversee that that, that happens. Because uh, last year I, I went through there, I, I was doing it somewhere else, I was like two in the morning, and they were still setting up. So that's something, but but something what you just mentioned is it's it's a defense which is good. So and, and that's one of the reasons why we stressed out that they needed to be ready for sound and check at six because my local band are doing sound and check on Saturday. The only band who is doing, um, well, two of my bands who are doing sound and check on Sunday are the two bands who are out of town. And that's one of the reasons why I specified that they needed to be ready by six. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Your motion? I Make a motion to put item six point two stated. Motion was made by uh, Councilmember Gonzalez. With the changes in the country. Okay. Second by Councilmember Roldan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moving on to uh, new business. Discussion and possible action to approve the sale of the city property located at 1482 North Van Brunt Avenue and R1 dash six zoning residential lot, approximately 6,117.70 square feet and a request for proposals submitted by Housing America Corporation. Good evening, by Mayor Castillo and council members. My name is Hector Tapia, Economic Development Director. As you know, the, uh, the city is uh, selling some properties. Uh, in this case, the three properties, the small, the small uh, sites. And uh, the RFP was published uh, on February 3rd, uh, on January 27th, 29th, 31st, and also on February 3rd, 2021. And uh, we were expecting some uh, more uh, yeah. RSPs on these city properties because we were waiting for the uh, appraisal. And the only property that we got the appraisal, uh, it was for the uh, property on uh, 1482 North Van, Van Brand Avenue. 
which is a residential lot on the north north side of the city. And um, because the RFP was only really published, uh, we expected to receive uh, proposals, and we only got one proposal uh, for that property. The other two properties are still pending. Uh, we're still waiting for the appraisals, so those are still pending. But the one before you tonight is for the property in 1472 North Grand Avenue. So House in America was the only uh, proposal that we that we received, and uh, in that property we also got the appraisal. The appraisal uh, came out to fifty-one thousand uh, dollars for the uh, and the size of that property is six thousand one hundred seventeen point seven square feet. The zoning on that property is also R16, which is okay for single-family homes. And uh, as part of the proposal, House in America is proposing to pay for the property forty-five thousand dollars. So, so based on the. Uh, the, the location, we have some concerns, uh, not actually concerns, but it's an easement on that south side of that property. And uh, uh, the public works uh, department has to connect uh, a drainage uh, pipe from the existing retention area into Babylon Avenue. So based on that knowledge, uh, we, the city, uh, city staff, uh, it's recommending to actually sell the property for $45,000, which is the, the actual proposal that we got. But the, the appraisal will be up to city council to accept the, uh, the $45,000 based on the knowledge that we have, the easement that the city requires to put a pipe or, or the, or the actual appraisal that we got for $51,000. But the city is how we feel that it's fair because of the, uh, the, the future property owner will not be able to actually construct from the easement uh, because of the uh, it's about 10 feet easement it will have to be placed on the south side of the property. So in fairness for the future property owner, I think at the, the Y, uh, uh, value and price is the $45,000. That's our city recommendation, I mean staff recommendation, but again, that would be up to city council to, to make a decision, $51,000 for the appraisal value, or based on the uh, knowledge that we know, that there's a limitation that a lot, that we may accept the $45,000 as proposed by, by Captain America. Um, on that uh, note, I think uh, the, the only motion that will be required for you, uh, uh, Vice Mayor and Council members, is to accept the, uh, the proposal as it stated, but we need to come back later with a resolution uh, to actually uh, start the sale of the property. This is only to accept the proposal by House in America, and then we need to come back with a resolution to actually uh, uh, for the sale of that property. Thank you. Thank you. How do we end up with that property? Th that was uh, according to uh, Public Works Department, that was a property purchased to actually use it as part of our retention area. But uh, uh, later it was found out it was not needed any longer, only a portion to the south of that property. So for many years, that property was vacant. Uh, so in the last uh, three months ago, City Council directed city staff to start looking into those small properties and start selling it instead of keeping it. So we came before you and you give us direction to to sell those uh, small lots throughout the city. In this case, it's only three. Uh, the Palm Ground uh, property, the uh, northwest corner of Spring and uh, Union, and a small little parcel that we have here on the alley, uh, on the city parking lot on the, north, on the south side. Those three properties are for sale right now, but we're still waiting for the appraisal for the other two. But in this case, we got we got the appraisal already, and South in America is submitting a, a proposal. In the fact that it's considered R6, R16 only now, by, by cutting it shorter because of the uh, what's going to be built there as an easement, yes. is it going to make it smaller lot, right? It's going to be less, less uh, no, it's, it's square foot. 
No, it's, it's, it's law doesn't change. There's just like, just like their current residence, there's an easement where they might have utilities. In this case, there is a storm drain pipe that can be about 18 inches in diameter. But they can't build it. They just can't build on top of it. Yeah. But the, the lot does not change. They'll still, they'll be able to, you know, possibly we won't, possibly we put a driveway in there or what have you, <clears throat> uh, but not necessarily build a structure on top of it. The yeah, reason is because you, in 20 years, 25 years, it'll be on property, but in 20, 25 years, 30 years, you never know what might end up happening. So the easement is for the future, maybe for the city of San Francisco to go in there and fix it. But it's still by Mayor and uh, Mr. Mami Gonzalez, uh, the, the zoning code still requires a building setback, seven feet. But still, you know, even though it's 10 feet, you still have to provide the setback for the buildings on both sides. But uh, if it is needed, if the, uh, the official owner is uh, trying to build a little bigger house, uh, we, we can still work with them with a minor bearings. To, to, instead of seven feet, can be five feet on the on the north side of the property to so move the building a little farther to the north. So that's the proposal before you, uh, council, my opinion, and council members. And uh, like I said, we still need to come back to you with a resolution. Any other questions or comments? Any motion? Vice Mayor, I have a, some questions. Go ahead. Uh, Hector, was uh, uh, was this a praise of value done? And does, did we disclose that we would need that easement because of that pipe that was underneath the, the property? Yes, we did. Okay, so, and it was still appraised at $51,000, them knowing that the pipe was there, then why would we want to give a discount? But the the actual uh, the appraiser the appraiser company well, they did not know but we disclosed it to the potential buyers uh, the, it was an easement so they okay. knew the buyers would need it. so why aren't we disclosing this information so we could get an adequate appraisal and when was this appraisal done it was done uh, the, um, we got the numbers uh, I think two weeks ago just before the uh, yeah two weeks ago yes. Okay, so for, for, for my sake and for, for the sake of uh, the responsibility that we have to our constituents, I feel that we need to disclose this to the appraiser. And if he sees that there needs to be a deduction, then so, so be it. And whatever that deduction comes to, then that's, that's uh, what we're willing to take for, for that property. I mean, the, this type of information, if you're the person in charge of that, you should be taking initiative and disclosing that to get a proper appraisal, Hector. Come on. Well, that was part of the appraisal. This is company they supposed to actually get the uh, that uh, information. That's their job to to collect that kind of information. But then again, this uh, as I said, this is a proposal for forty five thousand dollars for the actual city council. You had the decision to do fifty one thousand. The, the easement is there, it will stay there. Uh, it's just something that we feel like that is, it is a recommendation from the city staff. And so, so my recommendation is that we go what the appraised value was, but obviously if they didn't, if, if they weren't aware of it, they need to be aware of it. And if it's a $5,000 deduction, then it's a $5,000 deduction. If it's 10, it's 10. But I think it's only fair that the appraiser makes the decision, not not staff. How much would it cost us to for the appraiser to? It, it might not be much uh, to just let know as far as the easement is concerned. But one thing we weren't too too sure until actually today when I spoke with uh, well actually yesterday when I spoke to Yuma County. Um, engineer uh, regarding the, the easement. At one point, they wanted 20, 20 feet. Uh, then they reduced it to, to uh, I think it was 15 feet. But after I spoke to him, I said, "We, there's no way, there's nothing we can do with the 20 foot e easement or, or 15. So I, I mentioned to him that 10 feet would be 
okay for us to to uh, use or have, but 15, it's useless 6,000 square feet in the middle of a neighborhood. So as far as um, letting the appraiser know that there is a 10 foot easement, should it cost us more than maybe another $1,500 just to, to get that information? Yeah, that could be a, a revised appraisal if it's needed. Uh, the appraisal costs five hundred dollars, but um, we can do our bite and come before you doing the resolution. Is that the case? We can do that too. Yeah, I, I do agree with you know Councilmember Yapando that we we were talking about six thousand dollars and 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 this is I think some critical information that the appraiser should have known, you know, so that you know for us to have that, you know, the, now the appraiser did not have that information about the easement or did. Uh, he, no, I don't know. He just did. No, no. He didn't. So, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I mean, because if it's only going to cost us between uh, about $150, $150, and we're looking at like, we're dropping $6,000 for something that we're assuming that, you know, uh, I, I do agree with Council Member Yarpando on that. So, the uh, Vice Mayor, yes, that, uh, that's what we can bring that to the Council for next, next month. I don't think it should be a problem having it probably here uh, reevaluated and get something here by the end of next week. So it should be fine. And I, and I would just say that for future reference, you know, let's just make sure we have all our I's dotted and T's crossed just to make sure that we disclose everything that we were not going back and forth and the efficiency is there. So, you know, any other questions or comments? Do we have a motion? Make a motion to table this item. Motion was made by by Vice Mayor Castillo and second by uh, Council Member Roldan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Motion carries. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and, and I'm going to bring up a, a new business item 8.4. Discussion and possible action to approve and select a health insurance plan and other related benefits for City of Summerton employees for fiscal year 2021-2022. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this item, uh, as, as was discussed in the work session, uh, is uh, to review the benefit plans that we're proposing for uh, next fiscal year um, again uh, capital financial uh, after we went through a vetting process capital financial was selected as a broker of record and they've been our broker of record since january 2021 uh, today we have tom beaumont and rob brooks uh, representing capital financial um, they have a presentation ready that was presented to you during the work session and they're here at the moment to go over any parts of the presentation that you need to or ask any questions. Um, with that, do you have any questions for me before I hand it over? Okay, I hand it over to Rob Brooks and Tom Boma. Good evening, Vice Mayor, lots of members. Um, I had a hard time hearing back there. Oh, sorry, just here for questions. Uh, yeah, it, it, do, do we need to go over the presentation again or just... <laughs> no, no, you're good? Okay. Do you have any questions? Uh, you know what I do? I just have a question. I know based on the plans that were, that were being offered, um, you know, there are... Um, the HSA, how is that going to... How is the city... Uh, what's the city's recommendation? How is that going to be paid out if, if council... We we were thinking that the uh, the HSA uh, amounts that were uh, that were proposing that uh, to uh, pay that probably on a monthly basis to employees. So for example, if we select a plan that's uh, fourteen hundred, we would divide that out over over uh, twelve months on a, on a monthly basis. Um, this would be so that uh, in case employees leave uh, after they're hired within a short period of time. We haven't made, paid out all that money out all at once. I, I think what would be a good idea, and, and I think I knew some of these answers because I was I, I served in that uh, health committee meeting. I think if we could put the plans on the screen, 
Um, and then maybe um, Armando kind of talk about, you know, what the recommendation was from the committee, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and what was discussed. I mean, I, I have that, that info because I was on, on the meeting, but yeah. it would be a good opportunity for council members to, to hear that. Okay. Okay. Just as a reminder, um, just uh, uh, a part of the health insurance committee that all the individuals that sit in there um, uh, participating were um, uh, Mr. Lozano. Uh, Salinas, part of that uh, health insurance committee, Vice Mayor uh, Castillo, uh, Paul Dianda from uh, Fire Department, uh, Carmen uh, Juarez uh, as well, and uh, who else do we have from Priscilla, Priscilla Sotelo, Mr. Hernandez from the uh, Fire Department and Representative Fire and Police, I believe, and then no, Fire Department, uh, Correa, as well. Correa, Mr. Correa uh, was also part of the part of that committee. So we try to have a good representation across the organization so that we have uh, good input from different employees uh, to help us shape what our uh, benefits plan would look like. Uh, so they were part of that uh, vetting process of going over these, uh, these benefits um, uh, and, uh, and then considering which plans would be more beneficial for the city moving forward. See anything over here? <laughs> no, it, 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 I don't, it, it's not on the screen over here. So is that? Do you want to use the other presentation where they have the two uh, scenarios? Uh, yeah, the HSA uh, where we have the two scenarios. So on the HSA plans, um, we're looking at uh, the health insurance committee looked at uh, uh, the two proposals that were being presented by Capital Financial. So on, it's the one that has the HSA and their side by side. Is that the one? Okay, I can't see. <laughs> Is that the last the last slide? I believe. Is the last slide presentation? Ah, okay. All right. So, on the far right in the in the yellow highlight, we have the uh, scenario one and scenario two. Um, those are, are the plans that um, that have the uh, HSA uh, plans. One of them, uh, scenario one, has the HSA with a $2,500 contribution. This particular plan uh, would be a, let's see. I'm sorry, which one? Which uh, uh, this, this is the plan that the um, committee recommended. Yeah, scenario, scenario two. Would be, uh, 14, 14, yeah. So on scenario two, it's the one that was recommended by the health insurance committee. That particular plan has the uh, HSA with a suggested $1,400 contribution. It was recommended by the health insurance committee and that's the amount that would be contributed uh, to the employees uh, if they were to participate in that particular plan. Uh, was there anything else, any, anything in particular that you wanted to know? Vice, Vice Mayor, if I may. Um, there, was, there was two scenarios. Uh, one scenario, obviously, like uh, Armando did mention, it was looking at reducing our, our high deductible high plan from uh, leaving it at 5,000, but having an HSA contribution of 2,500. Obviously, it did include the life insurance of 50,000, the 100% for employee only. 
of dental and vision and telemedicine. If the employee would want dental and vision for their family, they would have to uh, purchase that. Uh, they would have to include that. And then for scenario two, and remember, th these are at, at a 60-40, uh, was, was recommended from last year to this year. So from a 70-30 to a 60-40. Scenario number two, it was um, continuing with a 60, 60, 40 with two base plans as far as a high deductible high plan and a PPO 5000. The difference is that the high deductible high plan uh, reduces as far as the deductible to 2800 to see what the difference. But um, what, one scenario was that we were going to do a $1,000, but uh, the benefit committee um, recommended a $1,400 HSA contribution. Um, and then obviously the third plan is a uh, buy it plan, but the employee and their family would have to um, add the additional cost to that. So any buy up on that will be coming out for the employee. So essentially there is two base plans, um, the PPO 5,000 and the HSA, either the continue with the 5,000 with a $25 deductible or a High deductible high plan with a $2,800 deductible and an HSD contribution of either $1,400. And, and by looking at the numbers at the here at the bottom, you know, if, if we let's say if we look at scenario number two where it's the, the $2,800, which was the committee recommended, we're looking at it at, at $1,144,327.90, right? Okay. Which is uh, scenario one which is really an $8,000 difference, um, getting the $2,500 uh, HSA. Yes. Now, um, and, and this HSA, like those funds, I mean, it's, it's in a way, it's kind of like a, kind of like a salary increase, but just towards the HSA, right? It, it, it'll, uh, it gives them that, flexibility that it could be applied towards their deductible to me. Correct. So for employees that um, that actually are high users of the of the plan, it helps it helps to offset some of the out of pocket costs for them. But then we have employees that uh, hardly ever go to the doctor. They don't have very many uh, medical expenses. So for them, uh, it would almost serve as a savings. This money would it's their money, so they could save it over time. Um, and have it uh, for future use if they, if they needed to. So but it's kind of um, a nice way to kind of incentivize our employees um, to go into these particular plans because they are less costly for the city than if our employees uh, gravitate to like a PPO plan, for example. So my, my question too, and I, you know, so what about if I'm an employee, I mean, what about next year? You know, are, are we looking at contributing the same amount or? Um, if I'm getting 1400 this year or 2500 I think I'm going to want something similar. Uh, did we think about that? Well, the, the, at the moment, this particular proposal, um, just like we did last year when we uh, presented the plans that we had last year, um, we're still, uh, we think that uh, uh, the plans, I think, help to mitigate some of the um, overall costs for the city. So we were looking for sustainability as part of the strategy. Um, I think once we went, to, we went to Blue Cross Blue Shield with a balanced funding type of plan, um, it, uh, it sort of leveled off our, our annual cost. So we're not looking at a huge increase like we did um, two years ago. We were looking at a, like around a 40% increase. So I think now uh, from last year to this year, um, we have more, more stability as far as the um, uh, cost to the city. So if we have that type of stability, I think we can continue to offer similar plans and offer the similar incentives uh, moving forward. Vice Mayor, if I may, it all depends a lot on what happens next year. Um, it all depends on the loss ratio. Obviously, a lot of this is estimates in terms of how many people will migrate to maybe an HSA, from a PTO to an HSA. Obviously, that contribution it, it, it differs. Um, so it, it is estimated, estimated that that will occur. Now, if you look at the total cost from the renew with no changes at 155000 with these new plans, obviously there's not much uh, difference there. So it, on the long, that's what I'm looking at. I was 
always looking at what is the long-term range for the city of Summerton and its employees, obviously. So looking at the long range, going into high deductible, high plan, on the long run, sustainability is what's going to keep us there. If folks do migrate, insurance is going to, is going to continue to rise. No matter what happens every year, it has increased significantly. Because of the pandemic, I think we were at 3.8. If it wasn't for the pandemic, I'm, a, I'm almost sure it would have been 6 to 10% increase. With a high deductible, high plan, you might still see maybe a 7% increase, so that 2%, you might not see it, that it because it, it didn't increase because it's obviously part of the, the 90-10. And the 10% deductible, you always look no matter what, on a high deductible. So it's, a, it's, it's trying to assist and help folks get the right plan that's a right fit for the family, if they have family. Another strategy that uh, we implemented um, last year to sort of mitigate uh, the, the cost to the city was to have um, the option of using uh, Mexico network. Um, and we have about 33 participants in that plan. So that's going to continue to be um, a strategy for this upcoming year. Um, and also the telemedicine uh, plans, I think, will help us to mitigate sort of the overall cost as well. Um, so I think it's multiple strategies um, that will help us to have sustainability, keep our, uh, flatten our costs from one year to the next, or not not, not have a huge increase like we did uh, a few years back. And I'm assuming, you know, you know, everything was taken into consideration when we looked at the HSA, you know, when we looked at, uh, you know, what, what, what other municipalities are, are doing when it comes to, let's say, their pay increase and everything, you know, um, you know because there might be, Let's say, for example, if it doesn't reflect on, 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 on their base pay per se, you know, but this is one way of, of, of it being kind of compensated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'm assuming that was looked into. We looked at all the ten scenarios. What, like I mentioned, uh, what's the best fit? Overall, I think the the plans uh, are pretty attractive. I, I think it'll definitely uh, be a huge improvement for our employees. Uh, I think all employees uh, so far, you know, everybody from the health insurance committee uh, got gave us really positive feedback on the plans that we were presenting and the additional the enhancements that we're proposing to the to the benefits. And I think that'll be reflected across the organization once we roll these out. Um, I think it's going to be a, a really positive uh, thing for uh, uh, for the city that we're uh, improving the benefits for our employees and show our appreciation to them. Uh, for their hard work, um, and so I think um, overall, um, I think it'll it'll also help us with retention and uh, and recruitment. Well, I'm glad that we're adding the visual and dental. Mm -hmm. That's something that we didn't have for our staff and really using the light. You know, that's okay. The, the, one, one more thing that you know, a lot of these new plans or or the high deductible high plan, HSA, you know, the mayor did was one thing that he would want to make sure that we had. And which reach, uh, I reached, well, obviously he mentioned that and he looked at his plans to make sure we're kind of equitable uh, from from the other municipalities, even the county that we reached out to uh, Mr. Goldan as well. So get the information from them as well. And I, I will say, Mayor did say, um, you know, he, uh, he said just, uh, you know, he wanted a voice that, you know, as long as we, uh, we keep the 60-40 split, for this year, you know, so I just wanted to go ahead and mention that. Motion. Need a motion? I make a motion to approve scenario two. Uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona as a health insurance provider and that line for a vision, dental, and life insurance for fiscal year 2021 22. Okay. Motion was made by Councilman. Uh, Gonzalez, which one was it? Was it uh, scenario two? Scenario two. That, that, that was a recommendation. That was a recommendation. Yeah. recommendation. Second. Second by uh, Councilwoman Garcia. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you, Health Committee, for you know taking the time and getting this together and providing these options for staff. So thank you for that. Um, moving on to uh, 8.2.
discretion and possible action to designate City Manager Jerry Cabrera as a certifying officer for all environmental review items for the City of Summerton as required by the Arizona Department of Housing. Hello, um, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Yolanda Galindo, CDBG Consultant for the City of Summerton. Um, this is a requirement from the Arizona Department of Housing to designate the um, existing city manager as a certifying officer for all environmental reviews or any environmental questions on any city. <coughs> any questions? Questions, comments? Your motion? Oh, yours, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Motion was made by uh, Councilwoman Garcia, second by uh, Councilmember Rodan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Moving on to uh, 8.3 discussion and possible action to contract BSS International for slurry seal work at Summerton Avenue as part of City's pavement preservation program. Uh, good evening, Vice Mayor and City Council. Uh, the item before you is to contract BSS International once again for our pavement preservation program. Uh, the City of Yuma Public Works, Public Works Department has advertised bill number 2020-200153 for pavement preservation services. Uh, City of Yuma awarded the contract to BSS International for this application, basically the, the slurry seal. For us, in order to continue with our pavement preservation of our streets, especially on Somerton Avenue, uh, staff want to proceed with the slurry seal application along Somerton Avenue uh, between our city limits, city limits, which is County 15 to County 17. Uh, currently, VSS International uh, will be working in, uh, with the city of Yuma uh, all this, uh, this month and the next month, and will allow us to uh, use the contract at the same price uh, proposed on bid 2020 200153 uh, for reference, I have attached uh, all the documentation uh, from the city of Yuma, the, the package, and the result. Uh, our recommendation uh, for city council is to approve and authorize city manager to sign the proposal from BSS International for the seal work in the amount of approximately 107000 which includes the mobilization cost for the slurry seal along Somerton Avenue. Any questions or comments? I'll make a motion to approve the Stated in the agenda. Motion was made by uh, Council Member Gonzalez. Sorry. Second by Council mm -hmm. Member Roldan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, summary of current events. Yes, uh, we have some uh, great news. Um, COVID 19 wastewater early warning test or sewage test. Um, we received the word today that uh, non was detected. And it goes back to what uh, I, I, I mentioned this again. Uh, Councilwoman Garcia has done with the uh, County Health Department and bringing those vaccines to our residents, uh, including some assistance with Sunset and obviously now Regional Center um, for Border Health is doing the same. So, with that, you know, we have vaccinated over 18,844 residents of 85350. Well, that's like a huge accomplishment for us. That's, we're thinking that going to be approximately over 80% of our community has been vaccinated. So <coughs> if I, if we still probably need about 5,500 uh, kids under 17, 17 and under. Another 2,500 adults, um, they're still um, maybe not wanting or what have you, but in essence, that's, that's excellent news. Um, we have turned in uh, several applications through the, the Honorable Representative <coughs> Congressman, Congressman from our Wikipedia office in the amount of $4 million for many projects that uh, Sam is very proud of. <laughs> And that was uh, sent to the Committee on Transportation and the Infrastructure. So, thank you very much. Carmen Juarez um, mentioned that uh, staff has received a request to change zoning on the property located at Southwest Corner of Madison Street and Summerton Avenue from commercial and low density residential to high density residential for the purpose of building a multi family development. A planning zoning commission on May 17th will review and recommend. And zoning commission meeting scheduled for last night had to be canceled for the lack of quorum. 
Staff is also working with Yuma County Pest Abatement District on temporary use permit for a property in Texas to allow poultry chickens. Of course, this is for the viruses, the West Nile virus, uh, find out if there's in the area. I guess from a couple times they come and spray. Uh, Mr. Sam Palacios, Public Works Director. Good evening by Union Council. Uh, our Cesar Chavez project update, uh, APS continues with the uh, full rotation on the intersection of uh, Cesar Chavez and Main Street. Uh, on the Fulton and Council reconstruction project, uh, subcontractors uh, completed the new sewer line along Council Avenue, and the uh, utility companies continue with their relocations. Uh, on the Salt Pathway project, uh, DP completed the uh, 10 foot asphalt pathway along uh, County 17 or the South, South Drain which is very good news for us, uh, between Bingham Avenue and Somerton Avenue. No, That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that I have. Thank you. Hector Tapia. Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council Members. I just saw three updates. As you know, the Oriental House of Spread was, uh, we had this one opening yesterday, on Monday. So now we have another option for uh, American residents, a Chinese restaurant. Also, the Yuma County Fiber Optic Task Force. And based on some funding coming to uh, provide fiber optic in Yuma County, uh, the Yuma County supervisors um, requested a formation of a task force to, to find out the needs in Yuma County to provide fiber optic in our communities. And as part of that discussion, um, we met last week and to just to introduce the, the conversation, how to do it. Uh, also, uh, at the same time, the city of Somerton is also working uh, to be able to connect all city facilities to fiber optics. So that would be a good timing to work with the county as a region and also at the local level to provide the fiber optic in the near future. As you know, there's a lot of, a lot of money uh, being funded uh, to uh, the rural communities to provide fiber optic, especially on the areas that they need. Uh, uh, it's a lot of findings uh, because a lot of communities did not have broadband. And based on that information, uh, a lot of more money coming into our communities. So that committee is formed and we're working on it. Uh, the Fireview Commerce Center is uh, still working with our proposals. We have uh, four proposals so far. And I still had three three lots uh, looking for uh, uh, the steel uh, conversations. So hopefully we get a uh, full 20 acres uh, uh, with a proposal very soon. And also we right, right now we're working with APS to start working on the uh, conduit for the future power connections to every single site. Like that. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Good evening, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Just want to point out that the Daigle Tournament fundraised a total of, of $2,800.57.86. Two teams are pending registrations due to checks being displaced or mailed incorrectly, but um, that amount has been confirmed through a breakdown. Um, Ramada, they're now open for reservations, all facilities also, and alcohol permits. Just for the community center, we're going to be taking reservations from the date of September 1st and moving forward. Uh, we are scheduled to reopen cultural center programs May 3rd, the week of May 3rd. We will be meeting with instructors soon as we review policies and procedures and, and opening um, protocols. Also, Joe Munoz's lab project was finished this past weekend on March 17th. Turned out pretty great and we're looking right now into quotes for the surfacing and for the, the striping and electrical. That's it. I am sorry. Good evening, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Um, this week we're really preparing for shutoffs next week and working with um, customers setting up payment plans and preparing for um, all the administrative items that we have to have in place in order to execute the shutoff. Um, and also we had um, interviews for the current open position. I think we're uh, just about ready to make a, make an offer. So thank you to Armando for your help with that. 
Um, we are also, um, I'm working on preparing for the truth and taxation hearings here in the next couple months, and um, as well as um, the budget. So um, that's my update for today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chief White, is here in the bill? Uh, she's working on the county's office on a large cash, cash forfeiture. Uh, traffic has been busy, but our drivers are following the rule of laws. We continue to work and train to provide better service to our community. We encourage, we continue to encourage our officers to conduct foot patrol as much as possible. All of our supervisors are busy finalizing training and procedural lines. Our department, uh, Paul Leonda, is on vacation. That is all. Oh, wait, 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 I forgot. HR? I'm sorry. Well, on the HR side, we're um, actively recruiting to some positions, and uh, we're going to um, uh, fill uh, the, finest, uh, the finest position that was open. We're in the process of filling that. We're in the process of selecting, um, 11, making 11 offers for the part-time lifeguards and getting ready to open up the pool. They'll go through certification process um, May 7th. And what else do we have? I think that's it. That's the that's that's highlights. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Villafando. Can you hear me? I do have one, one thing, Vice Mayor. Um, All right. Um, now that we're talking about additional vehicles for for the for for the city, uh, there's one thing that's been pending for years, even uh, prior to to our new administrator, Mr. Cabrera, and that's a take home po vehicle policy. So I would like like to, before we even move forward, we're purchasing additional vehicles that we could have have a, a vehicle take home policy. That that's all I have, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Gonzalez. Chairman, Chairman, I know that we are we will be promoting a, a special mini block party event on State Avenue on May seventh to promote the economic development for our vendors, but to promote not only for the vendor for the to promote this, but uh, to promote vaccination, vaccinations as well. One of the things that I, I would like to see and I'll be looking forward to is marketing, publicity, because uh, one of the concerns that we have, I always have when we do events, even if, you know, to this small scale, we do a lot of marketing, not just, I know this does a good job, you know, on social media, but we need to have good posters and, uh, and the businesses, banners, the interest of the free highway, because we're on, there's always people asking, you know, when did this happen? You know, when, we didn't even know about it. So I think we're going to do it, promote, you know, vaccinations as well as uh, make sure that economic development and, uh, and, and uh, to coordinate this event, you know, in, in a big scale, because it's a big. So, so, so um, just. Um, I'm currently working, I'm still waiting on a phone call back, but I'm trying to see if we can bring um, a few Pfizer clinics for our 16 and 17 year olds. Um, I reached out to the hospital because they're the only ones that have it right now with their um, the big pod in Yuma. Um, Ms. Headington mentioned that it is a, you know, there is a, a big possibility. So um, it's just a matter of coordination between either the hospital or um, the health department can administer. But um, I, I also want to say that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to help, and, and it's, it's a team effort. I plugged a lot of departments, you know, Brisa, Vanessa, even finance people to help out with registration and parks as well. Um, my kids have been involved, um, Nenas and Dejas, but it, it's a team effort. And, but like, you know, 
I'm, I'm very happy that we're at the numbers we're at. So that's it for me. Enough. Enough with that. <laughs> Hearing Jerry talk about the vaccine and how many people get vaccinated, and I know uh, uh, it comes along with CSS Latino, there's always have to be someone who's figured everything up and, and go get her and whatever they said, they just want to thank you, Martha, for, for what you're doing here for the city. Find the time to do whatever, you know, part in the very, very good. You know, just you know, I don't know about other things, but we're in a really good with that situation. So thank you for that, and thank you for the staff that helped out, you know, from, from whoever, Parks and Rec or Finance or any other department. You know, we only got 5,500 more, and then and, uh, I think it was great for me to read that we were the seventh, seventh safest city in Arizona. So, you know, uh, congratulations, kudos to the police department and everyone involved in that. So it was great. I think last year we were at third, right? Yeah. Well, so we're actually we're, we're trending in the wrong direction, but we'll, we're at least at the top ten. <laughs> you know, and, and, and just like Councilman, you know, Ramban said, you know, um, I did get my second vaccine, you know, uh, everything was well organized, you know, I, I went in at my scheduled time and, and it was really in and out and, and, you know, and I commend you for that, Councilman Garcia, you know, because I, you know, it does take, uh, you know, uh, a lot of effort. I've always said this, you know, uh, uh, you know, when things, you know, when things don't go right, it's probably because of lack of planning, you know, and, and right there, those vaccines, I mean, it, they've been on point. So the organization and everything, the planning, everything has been on point. So I, I, you know, I commend you and, and, and the whole team involved, everyone that helped you. You know, please let them know how thankful we are for that. Because everything was just smooth, you know. So so thanks uh, for that. And that's all I have. Being adjourned. <laughs>